Well, it is great to be back with you. And obviously we'll continue online, but hopefully next week we'll be able to get to see you in person as well. Hoping that that's uh, looking like it may very well be. We'll see. We'll keep you posted. Regardless, uh, as you can tell, I'm in another location. There's a point to it as well, though. You know, we're continuing on with the series, like, what if? Like, what if God did something really big? And, and last week, we looked at Jeremiah 29, and not just Jeremiah 29, 11, which says, I know the plans I have for you, not for calamity and destruction, but to give you a future and a hope. And that's a very true statement. But to look at the front side of that and what God had spoken before he said those things about how the nation of Israel had been taken into captivity. And he says, hey, right where you are and the place where you are, I know it's I know it's bad, but build, build your homes, plant your gardens, sow good seed, marry, have children, build generationally, multiply, expand right where you are in the middle of that terrible situation. Work for the peace and the prosperity of that terrible city that you're held captive in and pray. And then he makes that promise that he knows the plans he has for you. The plans aren't for calamity and destruction, but to give you a future and a hope. And so today I want to say, what does it look like? If we're going to go, Lord, what, we want you to do something big and we want to build, like, what does it look like to build right where we are? And I know many people are thinking like, okay, I know we're rebuilding a building, right? Are we building a new building? And, and, and the answer to that is like, yes, and maybe, maybe, and yes. So just stay tuned more on that. But that's not what I'm talking about. Buildings are not the body of Christ. And, and buildings was never one of God's purposes for us. It, it may have been part of a plan, but to get people to understand who he really is and what he has for them. So what does it look like to build right where we are? Okay, first we have to say, what are we gonna build and how are we gonna build? The what is this, and if you read the gospels and you listen to the teachings of Jesus over and over, he talks about the kingdom of God. You know, we've just had an election. That was the kingdom of man. Let me just remind you that the kingdom of God is a far cry from the kingdom of man. And we are called to build God's kingdom right here on this earth. So we build like that's what, that's the what. Well, here's the how. And Jesus actually directly addresses this in Matthew chapter seven. So here is what he says in Matthew chapter seven. He says, verse 24, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. And though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. Let's just recap that. Anyone who listens to Jesus' teachings, this is what he's saying. He's saying, if you listen to my teaching, it's like you're building a house on bedrock. Like, we don't have much bedrock around here. I don't know how deep you'd have to go in South Louisiana to get bedrock, but I know that I just came back from Kansas City and there was bedrock exposed. Like you could see the rock. And, and I'm thinking to myself, as I, I love construction and love homes. And I'm driving around looking at homes and, and part of what we were, were there for it's not to look at homes, but that's what I was doing in, in the drives and going, wow, okay, they have basements, which is always an anomaly to me, um, being from South Louisiana. And then they don't just build on dirt. They go down to the rock so that they know that the foundation is secure. And Jesus is saying, you'll have a secure foundation if you listen to my teaching. You're, it's like you're building on rock. And though the rain and the torrent, so in other words, there could be a hurricane coming with a big old storm surge. If you're built on the rock, you have nothing to worry about. That's what he says. Listen to my teachings and you are wise. It's like building on rock, but he doesn't stop there. He says, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock, verse 26. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and the flood come, and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So what are you building on? It's really a how question. How are you building your life? Are you building your life on the teachings of Jesus? Or is he just some guy that you think that maybe you should be like? Do you know the teachings of Jesus? This is from the new, this is for both the new believer and the person who's been following Jesus for decades. Are you really building your life on the teachings of Jesus? 
If you are, he says that you're wise. And then when the storms come, and he's not talking about Laura and Delta, though he might be talking about the aftermath an awful lot, at least the emotional and spiritual and craziness of it. He's saying, when the storms come, if you have built your life on the rock of my teaching, those storms are gonna come, but they're not gonna shake you. You're gonna be just fine. But if you've heard my teachings, and now he's talking to people who've been following him, and he's saying, if you've heard my teachings, but you've not actually obeyed them. It is one thing to know about the teachings of Jesus. It's another to obey the teachings of Jesus. If you obey them, then you're building on solid ground, on solid rock, on bedrock. But if you don't obey them, it's like building right here. This is a watershed, it's a washout. Nobody in the right mind would come and say, you know what, I think I'm just gonna build my house right here. It's a real pretty view. There's some water right there. Isn't that lovely? South Louisiana. Yes, there's water all over the place, but this isn't the place you want to build. Why? Because when the storms come, what's going to happen? This is, this is actually sandy soil. Believe it or not, this is like, you can, you can see it. When the rains come, that lake's going to flood. It's going to start draining everything to the north of here down. It's going to, if you built right here, your house would be kaput. It, it, it would be knocked down and it wouldn't take a hurricane to do that. It would just take one good South Louisiana rain. Anybody that built here, people would be like, what are they doing? That's crazy. That's foolish. That's just stupid. Why would you do that? Didn't you know? In Jeremiah 29, where God is speaking and he says, build houses right where you are. It's not build just anywhere. Like, how do we do that? Oh, we just build wherever we, that we build the place where we live on this one essential truth. Jesus, the creator of the universe, saw fit to come down, to send his creation, send down to his creation. Like he wrapped himself in an earth suit. And The father sent his son, but Jesus says that the father and he are one. It's the mystery of of the faith of how there's the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, but it's it's Jesus is is one. Why? Man, you know, I may lay down my life for you and you may lay down your life for me, but I love y'all, but I don't know that I could lay down the life of my son for you because you see, I love my son and I'd happily lay my life down for him. And yet God in his infinite wisdom sent his son, this Jesus who is God, to lay down his life for you and for me. And he lived a sinless life, took the payment for our sin on the cross. We need to remember that. And that Jesus is saying, If you build your life on my teaching, when those storms come, oh, and they're gonna come, you're gonna be okay. If you don't obey what I'm saying, you're not gonna be okay. You're gonna get washed out. The storm's gonna come, you built on on sand, you, you acted foolishly. So many people view living for God as like this, this, do this, don't do this. You better obey God or he's going to come and zap you with a lightning bolt. You don't understand how God, it's not how God builds. God's, God's word, Jesus' teachings, the law of God is not there to make our lives miserable and, and so that we should live in fear of a God who's going to smack us down if we mess up. It's, it's coming to the recognition that God is the great designer. And we are simply his design and he knows how we're called to function. And we should build on his words and not our best ideas. So I hope that makes sense. So how does God build? Here's how God builds. I really firmly believe this. He builds three ways. The first one is revelationally. That means that we have a revelation. What's your God story? Did you ever have the, the moment where the light bulb went off and you realized, who Jesus was and who you were in light of him. 
I was eight years old. I was just a kid at a really traditional church that at the end of each service, they were singing a hymn called Just As I Am. And 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 if God was dealing with you and, and, and you knew it and you knew you were a sinner, like you needed to go up to the front. And at eight years old, the light bulb went off. I didn't know everything about the Bible. I didn't know doctrine. I just knew that I was a sinner. Like I knew I'd done wrong and that separated me from God. It wasn't his plan for me, but that Jesus died on the cross to cover up my sin. And he gave his life for me. And at eight, with everybody singing, just as I am, I walked down. Nobody poked me or prodded me. My mama, my daddy didn't. I I got out of the pew and walked down the aisle and shook the pastor's hand. And I don't remember the prayer I prayed, but I remember that light bulb going off and me going, I need you, Jesus. See, this is the, the first step in building God's way. It's revelation. I've had many revelations through the years. I'm just gonna hit a couple key ones. I'm not gonna look at my watch. I know I don't have a ton of time. So eight years old, at 14 years old, realizing that, that God had a call on my life. He has a call on everybody. Go read Ephesians chapter four. There's a call on all of our lives, but there's a revelation. If you wanna grow in, in your walk with God, it begins with a revelation, but you'll never have that revelation unless you start listening, listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit whispering to you. Read the Bible because it's alive. Hebrews 4.12 says that it's alive and active. God builds through revelation. When's the last time you had a revelation? When's the last time God spoke to you? Now, I'm not talking like an audible voice, like he's never spoken to me audibly. But when's the last time you know that the light bulb wasn't you shining light, it was him? That's how God builds. It makes me very nervous when people now ask them, well, tell me, about, tell me about your faith journey. Tell me about your walk with God. And, and well, you know, I grew up in the church and like I always grew up in the church and you know, my mama went to church and so I went to church and you know, I got baptized and, uh, and yep, listen, none of that's bad. None of that's bad. But if the summation of your relationship with God is a series of events, rather than light bulb moments where God has revealed himself to you and you felt it deep in like you know, oh my gosh, I know. This is how we're to build like the place that God has for us through revelation that he's speaking to us. He's whispering to us that he's going, bing, this is it. How does that happen? You know, I, I think if I'd, if I'd never been dragged to church by my parents. I, I don't know that I would have had that revelation but because it comes on some level when you're exposed to the things of God and the word of God, like the Bible and people who love him. And, and I'm very grateful for, for that. I mean, I can look at the revelations in my life when eight years old, 14 years old, knowing that, man, God had something, a call on my life. I didn't know I was gonna be a pastor. And then I went to college and then he told me I wasn't going to med school. I needed to get out of that. And I didn't know what was next. And then the, the revelation that I was supposed to move to, to Lafayette area, to be a part of a new church. That was like a revelation. Like, I under, like there's just been time and time, the revelation that he called me to Lake Charles. <sighs> That's how he builds. The second way that he builds is relationally. If you look at the gospels, if you look at the Bible, like the faith walk that we have with, with him is never so personal that it's just me and him. In fact, all the way in Genesis, God looked at his creation that he created, a perfect God in a perfect environment, looked at Adam and said, it's not good that man should be alone. Okay, did God mess that up? He's like, did he like go, oh, wait a minute, I had a revelation myself, I missed something. I don't think so. Why did he, why did he say, ah, it's not good that man should be alone? Here's why, because he's called us to build together. You need God with all of your heart and strength, soul, and mind. May you love him and honor him and serve him. And, and may, may the teachings of Jesus be your bedrock. But Jesus also said this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Who are you loving more each day? 
Because God doesn't just build revelationally, he builds relationally. God, I want, I want to, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, not for calamity, destruction, a future and a hope. I want that future and a hope. Are you listening to God's voice and, and the revelation that he's speaking to you? Are you revelationally building? Are you relationally, relationally building? In other words, who are you pouring into? And who's pouring into you? Who are you transparent with? Who are you walking with? A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Are you loving people? I mean, this is just convicting. I don't want when the storms come and the storm of sickness or tragedy or trauma come my way. That's a big one. I don't want to then figure it out. Oh my gosh, I built wrong. And you see the, the, you see the, the storm waters coming and you realize, oh my gosh, I built on sand. Build revelationally, build on the teachings of Jesus, not just knowing about them, but having the light bulb, the revelation of them and build with other people. And here's the thing, unity isn't about agreement. I love my wife, she's amazing, but I, don't, I disagree with her more than anybody else on the face of the earth. And you know what, we still love each other, we're still committed to each other and we have unity. We may not always agree, but we have unity. And Jesus in his 12 closest followers exemplified that. He had one guy, Judas, the, the zealot, Judas, the zealot, which meant that, that he was actively fighting against the Roman occupation of his homeland. He was a zealot. It's a political statement. Judas was one and Matthew, the tax collector, who most Jews considered a traitor because especially the zealots, because he was working for the Roman government, taking taxes from his own countrymen for this oppressive force. And yet somehow they were in relationship. We have Peter, who's just a simple fisherman. And we have Luke, who's an educated physician. And yet somehow they were able to make all of this work. How? because it was Jesus that was the unifier. What do we build? Yes, we build revelationally, we build relationally. And then the thing, next one is we build generationally. God's called us to build generationally. That means it's bigger than us. And I said this last week, and you can go back and listen, that God said he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he's showing us I'm building generationally. In Jeremiah 29, he even says, hey, right where you are, you may not like it. You may be in captivity. Go ahead and build your home, stay where you are. Go ahead and plant your garden, sow good seed. And then he says, Mary, have kids, have your kids, find them spouses, get them married, have grandkids. Because God's call is always revelationally building, relationally building and generationally building. So how are we to build? Yes, those three ways, but here's the thing. We must have unity in the essentials. And here's the essential that we have to have unity in is the body of Christ. If we're gonna build something that God will say, what if, what if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. We'll never see a, a God, what if, until we come to the place where we can build together, revelationally, relationally, and generationally. And here's the foundation that we build on. Here it is, Christ crucified. Jesus, son of God and God himself at the same time was crucified for you and for me. He died for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. Number one, you can't keep him down. He's God. He's the, he's the creator of all of this majesty and beauty. But it's also a picture for us that when we surrender to him, it's a fresh start and a new day. And we don't have to live in the wastelands, the washouts, the runoffs of life. Because he has a purpose for us and he has a place for us. 
You can't see it. But right where this camera is projected, through there, that's where I filmed last week. It's way on the other side. And God's calling us on a journey. He's calling us as a people to a place. And it's not a place of captivity. It's a place of freedom. But we'll never get there unless we first choose to be unified and have unity in the essential of Christ crucified. There's freedom in the non-essentials. You don't want to wear makeup, ladies. That's fine. Don't want you to wear makeup. You, you want to take communion every day and say so that should be taken every day. You do that. But there's freedom in that. But what we must have is a desire to obey the teachings of Jesus, lift him up and follow him. So much of the church world has been about leadership. Guilty, been there. But can I tell you, I I really believe in the coming seasons, the body of Christ as a whole will understand more than anything else, we are called to be followers of Jesus. Follow him in obedience to his word and his ways. Follow him in everything that Jesus went through, us being willing to go through it as well. And in that, we build this kingdom. Will we build a building? Yeah, yeah, we will. Way secondary to everything else I just said. Keep our eyes on the things of heaven and follow the teachings of Jesus as we surrender all of us to all of him. So Father, Thank you that you are with us. Lord, thank you that you are calling us in this season to you to build your kingdom, not our own, to build your kingdom. Lord, help us. Help us in our weakness. May we honor you in everything we do. And may we not just obey your teaching. May we build on revelation that you give us. May we build together relationally and may it pass down to our grandchildren. In Jesus' name, amen.